uh, with that said, let's talk about uh, the the main takeaway is from the photoelectric effect that we talked about uh, just before we went on spring break here. And there, there is essentially, um, there's essentially four separate individual statements that combine to make a Nobel Prize, basically. So statement number one, light is in fact not a continuous wave. It is a bunch of individual particles and we call those particles photons. So unlike the uh, Maxwell's view and the pre-quantum view that light is a continuous stream of energy that moves at a given speed, we now, we now can physically talk about it as if it's a packet of energy with, with a given wavelength, but one that moves as a single bun a bundle of energy, which is entirely separate from what our classical view of it was. So light's composed of individual, discrete, into it, not only indivisible, but indiv um, in, not only individual, but indivisible, discrete packets called photons. And number two, each of those photons carries a different amount of energy based on the wavelength that it travels with. And by the way, when I do this thing here, like you can kind of imagine a little ball of energy that you, you can view as going up and down as it travels forward, but that's physically not actually what happens. Um, the, the way that we can, we, we, we do believe that photons go in a straight line. They don't go up and down like that. What we're actually analyzing here, which hopefully you know from a physics two um, Maxwell's equations uh, uh, basically explanation is that light itself, we now understand to be, uh, and Maxwell had known this, it is a combination of a varying electric field, which will, which will point one way and a coupled magnetic field pointing at right angles. So for example, into the board that both are orthogonal to the direction of motion. So right angle, another right angle. And this is by the way, what we call the pointing vector, P-O-Y-N-T-I-N-G vector. The direction that the energy is carried goes at right angles to the direction that the, the electric field and the direction that the magnetic field both oscillate in. So when I do this thing, what I'm really indicating is the electric field points up here and then the electric field points down there and it points up there and down there, if that makes sense. But the, fo the photon physically moves in a straight line or more specifically, the energy density that is at any point in space moves in a single axial direction. Um, I don't know why I said axis, a single, like along a single axis is what I mean. Uh, and so specifically number two, um, the, the amount of energy that a given photon carries is directly proportional to that wavelength. Or in fact, it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. Or what we can say is if you know the frequency of that photon, how often the, the electric field or the magnetic field oscillate back and forth, the energy of that photon is directly proportional to that frequency. So the energy is proportional to that frequency here. And specifically, you can write this as an equation that the energy for a single photon, and I'll write it like this, E sub gamma, and gamma is typically what we use to refer to a photon as. The energy of a single photon is given by some multiplying constant. It, it's a slope, uh, and we talked about this with the graphs, but it's a slope equation, and so there's some slope modifying the frequency f, or the better way to write that that we typically use in physics is the Greek letter nu. And then specifically, when you measure the slope of that graph, we have some constant h. And the value of h, remember, this comes from a graph of energy versus frequency. And whatever the slope there is, is the value of h. It happens to have a magnitude of 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. And the reason why I write this out is that we can figure out exactly what units it must have. So whatever units we measure frequency in, which are measured typically in hertz, one over seconds, inverse seconds, we need to take the, the, the units of frequency hertz, multiply it by whatever units that H has, and that should give us out units of joules. And specifically, this magnitude is if we measure the frequency in hertz, 
which typically we're, we're talking like 10 to the 14 hertz for, for typical um, visible light waves. You multiply it by this, by this value there, and that gives you the energy of, of a single photon. So if we're talking about, for example, 10 to the 14 times 10 to the minus 34, we're still dealing with energies on the scale of 10 to the minus 20 joules or 10 to the minus 18 joules around that, around that scale. So the energy of a single photon is tiny, and that's why we don't really detect them with our eyes, that you need many, many, many photons to, to basically bring you enough energy to be detectable. The units of this thing, by the way, though, it needs to, it needs to spit out joules given hertz. And so literally, it's just joules hertz. Sorry, um, joules per hertz. Let me, let me try that again. Joules per hertz. When you remember that hertz is actually inverse seconds, joules per hertz is actually the same as joules times seconds. So that's the standard SI value for that, that constant H. And by the way, we call that Planck's constant. Again, just to be clear, Planck's constant is simply just the slope of a graph. Um, and Einstein uh, won the Nobel for, for the thing that was basically named after Planck. So, you know, you can, there was actually a great deal of kind of uh, collaborative spirit back in the early 1900s. And it, physicists and, and mathematicians would, in, would intentionally like, you know, come across this great result and name it after someone they, they admire and not attribute to themselves. So it was kind of one of those like, you know, back and forth games amongst this the entirely collegiate atmosphere at that point. So anyway, um, this is the, the, the probably the single most important, these two combined are the single most important uh, uh, results of the photoelectric effect here. Okay, so I, I wanna make a slight correction here. Um, there's actually kind of five tenants, I, I said four, but that was viewing these collectively as one. So uh, we're gonna list five important results. So those are the first two. The third one here is that um, for every photon that, that's incoming onto a given surface, and in the case of the photo, photoelectric effect, we viewed it as a light source incident on a conducting plate. So a metallic plate where specifically you have atoms whose electrons are we now know to be orbiting nuclei. So we, we have some metal and there's electrons that are that we now understand to be what we call valence electrons. But um, we have, let's see, what, what happens is each individual photon we now understand can be absorbed by a single individual electron that you can never split up that energy between more than one electron. You either absorb all of that energy at once by that electron, or you don't absorb any. And specifically what happens when that electron absorbs that photon will depend on number one, what that photon's energy is, but number two, how much energy it needs to be released from its nucleus. And so that's what we call the, the, uh, the work potential or the other reasonable word for this is the binding energy. So number three, every metal or every electron, we should say in a, in a given element, will be bound to its, its, its neutron by a finite amount of energy. And you need to give that electron exactly, or at least that much energy, I should say, to be able to ionize it or allow that electron to escape. So each, uh, we'll just say element or each atom has a given binding energy or work potential, um, which the photon, in order to release that energy from that atom, has to have at least that amount of energy. And we do call this typically W, or you might see written as that, the work potential. And so as a bit of a corollary to that, if the incoming energy, the photon, if E sub gamma, and I'll write it like this, if E sub gamma, the energy of that photon is greater than W, what happens is the electron is released. And more, and more precisely, the electron is released and whatever excess energy the photon had, however much the difference between E minus W is, is exactly the, the energy that the electron now carries. 
And finally, in the photoelectric effect, what we measured, remember, was so we had electrons, sorry, we had light incident on a metal plate. And we had a nearby oppositely charged metal plate. So it's a capacitor. When we released electrons from one plate, they jumped to the other and they traveled down a wire. So what we actually measured in the experiment, um, well, we knew the intensity of light incoming and we measured the outgoing amperage or current. And what we found was that the only way that we could adjust the current, but the, the outputted current was not to increase the energy. So by changing, by changing the frequency or, or the, in fact, the color of light, it had no influence on how much current was produced. What happened, what, what, the way that we can affect that though, is instead of changing the amount of energy of the photons, the, the frequency, if you change the intensity of the light, you turn up the light bulb or you make the light uh, glow brighter is literally what it is. The brighter that light, as long as the energy of those photons is above that work potential, the brighter the light, the more current we get. So that tells us the brightness of the light directly translates to how many electrons are released. And because each photon interacts with exactly one electron, if you release more photons, sorry, if you, if you release more electrons, you immediately know that you must have had more photons there. So the intensity of light is simply the measure of how many photons there are. And, and, and that's a, you know, it, it was more remarkable, I think, that by changing the intensity of light, or sorry, by, by, by changing the energy of that light, by changing the wavelength, we don't see a change in current. We do see a change in how much, in how much uh, energy each, each electron is carrying, of course, because that's because we're providing more energy to each individual electron. But by giving it more energy, we, we didn't see more electrons released. And that's really important. And that, again, the important thing is that each photon can't be split into more than one electron. You either give all your energy to that electron or none at all. 